and recreate it <laughs> in other ways. So he joins others in doing that. Um, but I, do, I agree with him. I've struggled with this one a whole lot, but I agree wholeheartedly that organizing doesn't take place uh, at different levels. That's, if you look at it, there's no way that that is happening in the day-to-day -day interactions of what we do. Uh, I think what is replaced in here, uh, instead of the macro and the micro, is a scaling up and scaling down. And so what comes in this is an effort to kind of pull these together through inductive and deductive theory building. The thing that's kind of a struggle for me in wrestling with this one is there's always a point of entry. The theorist has a point of entry, the researcher has a point of entry, and that point of entry happens somewhere in a system. Now that also preserves levels as, as just bottom up and top down a little bit within that. Uh, but I think it says something about points of entry that need to be in this kind of approach, holding these together. So one thing might be to connect those in notions of multiple points of entry through multiple communities of practice and trying to find ways to kind of look at this metaphor as um, an orientation or look at this dialectic as an orientation to what we can try to do with the fact that there's a, a, a flatland, but yet there are multiple ways we enter into this. Uh, the one thing that I think is really difficult, this is in many ways the undeniable paradox. I think this is the hardest paradox to tease out, is the macro-micro flatland. And I think it's hard to struggle with it and come up with options, but I really believe that um, the multiple points of entry is an idea to begin to do that. The final dialectic of subject and object uh, becomes managed through, in my mind, a kind of integration. Uh, and that integration uh, is a balance between the two, and some scholars would argue it's a forced merger. Uh, and uh, that agency mediates the subject and the object, uh, that there's a marriage, a marriage between them. They are both enabling and constraining through this marriage. As the hybrid between these two agencies work, though, they're also situated in networks as opposed to in individuals. Um, the one thing that becomes really interesting about subject objects and their recursive intertwining is the way in which they transform each other and work with the social and the material. And I think this is where more extensions and developments of this theory can go on. Uh, we're almost all familiar with Latour's example of the gun and that guns don't kill themselves. I mean, they don't kill by themselves. And the gun does add something. It is not neutral in it. And there's an interconnection between the two uh, in that they do become homogenized in action. But integration, and to some extent a little reframing in this mode of managing the dialectic, um, has some of its uh, uh, challenges, I believe. Um, and it comes because of the way we treat the material and the social world. First of all, I want to say to the credit, they are not treating the material in the social world as passive, inert, insignificant. Uh, they're not collapsing the material into the natural. Uh, but there are ways in which I see humans as being malleable, uh, is ma material as being malleable by the humans. Um, so, for example, when we refer to social objects like the red light, uh, being stop or speed bump, slowing down traffic, even long after humans developed this. Uh, Harry's example this morning of the stoplight going off was a beautiful one. Uh, and what it showed is that it doesn't, it creates a pattern of unpredictability that's in this. And it's not clear what happens when these kinds of signs no longer work in the sign system. So one way to extend this theory in my mind would be to connect the material and the social in kind of a way that privileges the material without social meaning added to it. Uh, so one idea for this is to look at permeable and impermeable boundaries of this. Uh, and I think there are ways that, that the social material recursively reflect on each other to try to look at how those boundaries get penetrated and sometimes they don't. Uh, and there's a predictability that occurs and sometimes it doesn't. 
A second way to extend this one, and maybe to move out of integration, which I really don't know when managing that dialectic is the most ro robust way of doing that. But the second way to do that might be to get more intertextuality into the way that we begin to think about uh, what that relationship is. Uh, i use for an example one of the papers that I heard was talking about body. And uh, we can talk about body is in the moment of how we uh, respond to how it is social meaning is going on and the body has meaning after individuals have left and has a presence and absence with it. But one other thing that happens is there are many meta texts that are coming into play. And the way we develop those meta texts might enable us to begin to, to give the materiality more privilege. I think Cohen and Ferris begin this approach in trying to look at a security system in an apartment and how it's grown out of multiple meetings and conversations and uh, uh, what uh, ways it operates after the people who've developed that security system leave. But what seems missing to me is that the materiality uh, alters the nature of organizing um, and that it's unpredictable, it's nonlinear, and it doesn't work with social meanings. Um, and I think it's important to give it its privilege and its presence and its respect independent of that. So in closing, Taylor and colleagues, I'm going to go with this one, have really developed one of the most comprehensive and generative and robust theories of what an organization is. It's grounded in communication, rooted in characteristics, characteristics and features of language. It provides a very sophisticated way in which text conversation and meta conversations connect, transcend, and reframe dialectical tensions. Uh, it certainly does this with the text conversation, the univocal and the multivocal. The theory also addresses ways in which the tensions are interdependent, recursively related, and invoked in an array of uh, kinds of sub-dialectics like stability and change and fleeting and enduring and integration and differentiation and presence absence. It's a masterful view of theory building. Through teasing out and preserving the interplay among the dialectical tensions, it exposes a lot of conundrums, puzzles, arenas that need and can be extended. This analysis calls to attention of how to unpack some of those. Uh, certainly through contestation, through boundaries and understanding boundaries, legitimation, uh, predictability is other dialectics that could be brought into play. Um, it also, in my mind, uh, provides us a way to engage in a dialogue about all of these because we're part of this theory building process in very many ways. So we play tribute to you, Jim Taylor the founder of the Montreal School, for the depth, richness, and expansiveness of this theory. It's evolved over time. <laughs> uh, it's taken on inconsistencies. It has continued to wrestle with these puzzles, as any good theory should. We're indebted to you for its heuristic value. It lives on through scholars. It will be applied, appropriated, translated, misinterpreted, interpreted, as any good theory should. Um, it is fertile ground, and it's unsurpassed in the many ways that scholars to come are going to wrestle with the notion, what is an organization? Thank you. Thank you, Linda.